Asu. Good evening, everyone. My name is Siddhi Dheer, and I serve as the Executive Director with Thai Singapore. Welcome to our Go Global Huddle session at Thai Singapore, where we would discuss about expanding to various markets beyond Singapore. Today's session would be focused on expanding to Indonesia, the next consumer giant after China and India. We would be talking about the business ecosystem there, the upcoming and thriving sectors, and the investor landscape. The moderator for today's fireside chat session is Chris Tran. Chris is the managing partner for CapConnect, a technology investment bank. He also serves as a board member with Thai Singapore. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, Siti, and I'm really excited about today uh, because we tackled the big one uh, that is Indonesia, and so happy to have you together with us, Chuan. Uh, it's a public holiday in Indonesia, but Chuan has uh, kindly uh, donated some of his time to be here on our intimate huddle session. So thank you for coming along, Chuan. Indeed, indeed, Chris. Before, before I hand it over to Chris to take it forward with Chuan, a few housekeeping rules. Please ask your questions in the Q&A section, which you may find on the bottom of this page. The recording would be shared with all registrant attendees after the show. In case your questions are not answered during the show, we would be sharing them with our guest speakers after the session and share it back with you over an email. With that, Chris, over to you. Fantastic. And, you know, Chuan is a classical Singapore export to China. He was in Hong Kong where he acted as CEO in corporate and was a senior management level professional in many larger companies. Wanting a new adventure, he has been in Indonesia in startup raising funds and running the finances of, as the CFO of Fabelio. Fabelio is the Wayfair of Indonesia. It is the biggest online, offline, integrated furniture retailer in Indonesia with 20 plus experience center stores and counting. During COVID, Fabelio really showed its resiliency. The Fabelio story produced 25% growth during that year and actually shifted gear to greater online sales representing towards 40% of total sales. And so I'm just delighted to have Tuan to share his experience in Indonesia as a foreigner and also as the CFO in Fabelio, one of the fastest growing and leading tech companies. In fact, Tuan, um, what we didn't uh, cover, but um, there was a recent article around the fastest growing companies, right? What was that? Oh, that was uh, organized by, by Financial Times, if I'm not wrong, to rank um, the fastest growing companies in Asia Pacific. And oh yeah, we, we, we were ranked. I think okay. we were number what, nine? I, I, I can't recall. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, Chuan. That's thank an you. excellent and result. Thank you for having me, Chris. Um, and thank you for connecting me with Kai. Yeah, and, and, and um, they can't, can't wait to get into the story, which is quite interesting. You know, Chuan, you have a wife and three kids. Um, you had a great track record in China, corporate. Um, classically, a lot of Singaporean professionals end up there. Why the hell the craziness to go into tech and then Indonesia? What happened? Oh. I was in China um, in the early days. Uh, that was in early 2000s when the economy was just opening up. So the knowledge of the Chinese people in the, in the international capital market back then was quite limited. So there's this window of opportunity um, for people like me to play a hand-holding role for the Chinese entrepreneurs to bridge foreign capital with the Chinese economy. And I was in Beijing for seven years, I moved to Hong Kong, joined a public company, did that for four years. And a decision was made back then to, to move back to Singapore to, to, to slow down. Um, and, and I started traveling extensively throughout Southeast Asia after moving back to Singapore. Uh, that was uh, 2015, 2016. Um, and I was very impressed with uh, two, two economies, uh, Vietnam for its uh, robust growth. And of course, Indonesia simply for, for its size 
and attractive demographics with a huge and growing segment of the middle class population. So coincidentally, I, I got connected with the founders of Fabilio um, after getting to know them personally better and develop a, a good understanding of, of what we are trying to achieve in Indonesia. I decided to uh, move to Jakarta. That was in uh, early 2018 and, 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 and joined this promising startup. Yeah, and you know, the landscape has really changed a lot. Um, you know, it's probably a classical case of uh, right place, right time. So let's drive down into Fabilio just as a way of, you know, really getting a tangible uh, uh, insight into what's been happening. You know, with Fabilio, uh, you talked about um, getting to meet um, the founders. Can you tell me, you know, what, what made you excited uh, about the company from a founder point of view? Oh, the founders are young. Um, it's, uh, we have three co-founders, um, one from Germany, one from um, Italy, and one uh, from Indonesia. Uh, very young and passionate, and they really know what they're doing. Um, very impressed by the, the, their understanding of e-commerce and, and the vision they have of building for Bidou in the in the most successful um, furniture retailers in the region. Yeah. Um, and, and of course, um, um, we had a lot of uh, discussions, intense discussions on, on the direction the company should be heading, you know, um, and, and um, so we have, we, I enjoy the chemistry. Uh, and um, so faced with my midlife crisis, instead of, you know, uh, going out to buy a new sports car or get a new wife, decided to join the startup. <laughs> Excellent. And, um, you know, you spent some time in China, which is interesting. And we always hear about Indonesia, about Gojek, Tokopedia, now, of course, Goto. Uh, and the perception, if you read all these big headlines, is that, you know, e-commerce has really run a good course. But actually, when we look at the overall picture and, you know, you being on the front lines, um, you talked to me uh, when we were preparing for this around how there's still so much to do um, without sort of in a nutshell. Can you tell us a little about how Fabilio is bringing in new retail uh, in terms of furniture retailing and how it's a reflection of um, many of the e-commerce opportunities that are actually still available uh, despite these emergence of uh, these e-commerce giants in Indonesia? Right. I think everyone has a different, their own definition of new retail. Um, very, very subjective. There's no textbook definition, unfortunately. Um, we run our new retail model to deliver quality and affordable furniture to our customers. Um, as you said, it's an online, offline model in which we acquire our customers using digital marketing. And we have a really deep understanding of our customers' behavior um, because we collect lots of data um, from our various online and offline touch points. So armed with the data, we, we are able to target and retarget our customers in our attempt to, to convert them at our uh, both online and offline channels. Mm. And this is really unique in Indonesia. Um, we believe our model is, is most effective um, in penetrating our target customer group, which is composed mainly of the millennials who are tax savvy, tax savvy and have the preference of shopping online. So then there might be some big um, furniture players um, in Indonesia, much bigger than us, uh, Ikea, for example, um, but we're different. So no, nobody runs a new, mo new retail model like this. Yeah, you know, I like the whole idea when we first um, got to uh, know about Fabilio in that, you know, really in Indonesia, if you wanted something better than Ikea and something that was just, you know, a little bit more fashionable, et cetera, you just had to be super rich and hope and pray that, um, you know, the store had your stock. Um, and then we visited one of your experience centers and it was um, quite a wonderful experience and had curation there, et cetera. Just in terms of demonstrate the growth, I mean, we met maybe four years ago or three years ago. 
What was, I guess, the footprint of the Experience Center stores back then? So we, four years ago when I just joined the company, we probably had around eight uh, Experience Centers or showrooms. And now we have 23. Mm -hmm. And if you look at Fabilio, we're still very much a Jakarta, Jakarta brand. Um, most of our showrooms are located in the greater Jakarta area. And um, yeah, so there are a lot of space for, uh, for growth going forward. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Let's touch on uh, foreigners entering into Indonesia. Um, you know, one of the interesting points around Indonesia is there's a typical structure uh, around corporate structuring and fundraising that follows. Can you share a little bit on that with us? So the common structure of Indonesia startups uh, like Fabilio is to set up the holding company in Singapore. Um, and fundraising is, is being conducted at the holding company level. So there's, there's a natural linkage there. Mm. Um, yeah. Okay, great. And then if you actually look at the founders of a lot of foreign companies, um, you know, you provided a lot of good examples. Let's start with uh, Grab, which is obviously uh, quite busy in Indonesia. The reality is that Grab actually has Singaporean and Malaysian founders, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and look at us. We have uh, Germany, German, German founders, Italian founders, and, and Indonesian co-founders. Right. Um, there's some other examples. Um, Bukukast, obviously, a very... Um, uh, promising startup, which has raised a lot of money recently. Uh, they have an Indian founder, Indian co-founder and Italian co-founder. Uh, Prixla.ai, they just closed their series A recently and, and they have an American founder. Mm -hmm. So there is actually a lot of foreigners that are setting up these companies, good linkage to Singapore, doing well. They are. Uh, attraction to uh, Indonesia then. Um, you know, we all know about the demographic story, um, the emerging consumer market. Uh, tell us a little bit, you know, on the front lines, let's get a little bit granular. Um, tell us about the young millennia working there. What has your experience with them been like? Very positive. Um, so I, I, this was, this is probably my first time working with the young, young millennials. Um, as a startup, obviously you will have to, um, work with a huge group of uh, younger uh, younger staff. We hire a lot of local, locally educated Indonesians. And, and as long as they're able to, um, as long as the startup founder is able to inspire them with, with uh, leadership and vision, um, the, this group of uh, younger workers are really, willing to put in the hours um, to help drive the company forward. Yeah. You know, you hear about stories, uh, Jack Ma back in uh, the early 2000s and uh, even the VCs um, having real trouble convincing uh, not just only uh, young staff or any staff to join them, uh, but actually their parents, right? Why would you go up to startup land, et cetera? Uh, do you think you've seen a transition where now it's cool to work for a startup because there are these, you know, Jack Ma success stories, uh, et cetera? Is no, the same thing happening? No, of course. Um, gratefully, we have, um, Indonesia has already developed a few unicorns. Um, so it is cool, very different to work in a startup uh, compared to a traditional corporate. Um, younger people uh, like to be associated with, uh, with cool brands and, and we believe Fabilio is one, uh, which is drawing talents. Yeah, great. Let's talk about the consumption pattern then. Um, you, you told us an interesting um, behavior around the consumer, um, which is a little bit different from what China was. And obviously China struggling to become export orientated to, uh, or I shouldn't say struggling, but um, is with that challenge of changing from export orientation to a strong domestic consumption economy. Uh, can you talk to us about, you know, consumption patterns and what's interesting around Indonesia's consumption patterns? Um, my understanding of the Indonesian culture is, is that the people are, they have a high willingness to spend. Um, and a lot of them are willing to take on credit. 
um, to satisfy their desire for better living. So they would, um, they demand for uh, quality products um, in their daily lives. Um, they really want to upgrade their like, standard of living um, and they're not afraid to spend their disposable income to achieve those, those Interesting. desires. Interesting. Um, the funding environment, uh, clearly it's, uh, it's, it's changed a lot. Um, you know, what do you think are the prerequisites around the funding environment? Can, can anyone just get the money or, um, you know, are there one or two things that you've found that um, have been important uh, to get the funding you know, in terms of launching and, and really driving in, in, into Indonesia? Well, all solid business ideas are, are attracted to VCs. Um, there are a lot of VCs uh, being set up in Indonesia for the past few years. Uh, and a lot of international VCs are very active uh, looking at Indonesian startups. Uh, Indonesia is just like a huge magnet for capital as long as you have a solid uh, business ideas. Um, we are in the retail sector. Of course, uh, we, we, we are direct proxy to, to the middle class and the millennials in Indonesia. And we use um, technology and data in, in penetrating the segment of the market. So this is interesting. <laughs> well, you know, certainly the business is sexy enough to get a, a good Series C round uh, going and sexy enough to have 23 stores. So uh, I wouldn't say for Bilio, it's not sexy. Uh, so in terms of some of these other sectors, uh, e-commerce, new retail, insure tech, uh, fintech, do you see deep tech being a real thing in Indonesia, for example? Um, perhaps not in the immediate future. Um, mm. maybe probably because of the, the limitation in talent pool, in, in engineering talent pool. So one, one thing we have to note when we come to Indonesia is um, the competition for the right talent. It's very intense. And because there are lots of unicorns already in the market, so, so obviously they, they will get, um, you know, the best talents and, and we have to scrape, you know, scrape for, for the, um, the rest of the, the market. Uh, so a lot of tech companies I know do outsource the coding or engineering uh, requirement to, to countries like India or Vietnam. And some, some, some other companies even set up their data team in Singapore, right? So, um, so deep tech, uh, I believe it will happen. It will take place in Indonesia, but maybe not within the next two or three years. Mm, mm, mm. Um, that's a good segue actually into, let's talk about Yogkata. Um, so, you know, our audience uh, predominantly around founders and investors looking at market entry into Indonesia and the engineering uh, background. Um, you know, we've seen various trends, obviously offshoring uh, into Vietnam, even into uh, Europe uh, around tech um, uh, to Singapore for some of the high value added stuff. I mean, has Yog, Yog sorry, Yog, <laughs> please forgive me, where the universities are around Bangdong, Yog? Yogja. Yogja, Yog. right. Um, has that grown in your time there? And, and, and is it really, you know, becoming a low cost development center? Or is it sort of on and off that story? It is. It is. Um, it is a hotbed. I mean, it, it, the government is obviously taking initiatives to mm -hmm. develop um, develop the, the local talents, and um, in fact, we we are also sourcing our talents from from that area. Um, we are even considering um, setting up a team there, simply because the talent is there and. And um, and the living standard, and obviously the, the pay grade is uh, they're lower there. Yeah. Okay, so it's cost effective. All right, great. So let's talk about tips for starting in Indonesia. 
you know, when we talked to uh, Bobby, uh, who you also met last time we were in Singapore, um, he really talked about, you know, for Vietnam, maybe just study the market first. I mean, obviously, we all know it's important to localize around language, build some key relationships, um, see what the mindset is. But in Indonesia, would you actually, you know, say, spend some time to study or the reality is it's just so fast, everything's happening. Uh, you know, you should start straight away. You know, I still believe in having a, a good local partner. Um, a lot of uh, um, foreign foreign startup founders I know in Indonesia, they do have their their connection to Indonesia. You know, some have their family um, in Indonesia. Uh, some have their roots in Indonesia. Some have already uh, local friends. And um, so it's hard uh, because of, because Indonesia is just a totally different country in terms of culture, language, um, and legal perspective. Uh, it's always good to have a, 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 a local partner who shares the vision and who, who is able to get things um, done locally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is uh, important. And we also touched on, you know, you need to hire people. Um, let's touch on some of the, you know, you know, corporate elements, um, local labor laws. Yeah. So, so um, one aspect usually neglected by startup founders in the early stage um, is to get the right and good HR person, right? Um, in Indonesia, um, that should be. Um, deemed as one of the most important hires in the early stage um, because uh, we will be able to avoid a lot of uh, uh, you know pitfalls in um, in in Indonesian uh, legal system and including tax including you know pensions <laughs> um, so um, and also you know um, the right the right HR person will also help in recruitment which is as I said, uh, very uh, competitive in Indonesia. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Jokowi came in and there was this big promise around making business processes more streamlined and reducing regulation and making it more open. Um, has it improved um, doing business and the corporate um, administrative side of things since you've been there? Not drastically. Yeah, there's marginal improvement. Um, I would say the local law is still very protective of the in Indonesian workers. So we will have to be very careful in, um, in dealing with, with employees. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. So um, we've got some questions, which are good. Um, but just to sort of wrap up this part, um, you know, what are some of the people and organizations that you would... Um, you know, suggest that potentially uh, our audience today can can get in touch with. Um, you know, we met through Endeavor, uh, which was which was um, uh, we met again through Endeavor, which was great. Uh, can you tell everyone about Endeavor? Well, it's a U.S. based um, entrepreneurial association, um, and it uh, it provides mentor and guidance to the founders uh, who are members of the group. Um, it's very popular in, in Indonesia and our founders are the, are, are the members and we have got very good uh, mentors uh, assigned to us, uh, which are very helpful in preparing for our fundraising and potential um, IPO plan. Yeah. yeah, so Endeavor is, I would recommend Endeavor to any startup founders. Yeah, they do a really good job. Um, any others? Um, we have a local um, local group uh, it's called Well Spaces. Well Spaces Group is it's a looser um, association. Uh, it's not that as formal as uh, Endeavor. Uh, so it's founded by one of the uh, reputable startup founders in Indonesia, and um, they have regular regular gatherings. And the, the, the founder of, of the group, Ario, he, he throws the best parties in, in Jakarta. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, and maybe just one more. 
Oh, um, let me think. If the Founder Institute, that, that uh, there's a Silicon Valley accelerator, which has a local chapter in Indonesia, but I am not as familiar as, uh, as the Founder Institute. Um, I, I'm not so familiar with the Founder Institute as the other two. Yeah. 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 Okay, great. Well, uh, it's time to get in uh, with some of the questions. And uh, one of the first ones is, I guess, parallels to China. So maybe one of the things we can um, get to is what are some of the parallels with China? And I guess, what are some of the differences in terms of, you know, mapping out uh, the Indonesia story, tech story vis-a-vis -vis China? Well, China now is a very different a uh, very different monster, right? Uh, but back then when I was there, um, it was very similar to, to Indonesia. Um, and that's exactly why I'm back here trying to replicate what, what I've done in, in China. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the, the living, the, the, the standard of living, it's, uh, it's acceptable. Um, air is bad in both countries, <laughs> uh, food is fantastic, you know, and um, yeah, the people are friendly and, and, and I would say most, most foreigners have a good time living in Jakarta. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about that one actually. What's the expat experience like? Um, you, you know, you talked about uh, the, 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 the standard of living is acceptable. I mean, one of the things that everyone complains about is, of course, the traffic. Uh, is there any chance the traffic would get better, in your opinion? Uh, obviously, COVID has affected that. But, well, uh, yeah, it is, now, COVID. it is now, now better, much better with COVID. Uh, prior to COVID, um, it was bad. Uh, but the, the MRT has helped considerably in, in, in reducing the congestion. And it's very convenient. Um, if you have meetings along the MRT line, um, I usually choose to take the MRT. It's comfortable and it's uh, fast. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you are comfortable in Indonesia. Um, any sort of downsides, you know, to be careful of as an expat? Uh, I mean, you know, sort of um, healthcare, uh, some practical things like that, safety. Both China and Indonesia are very safe, uh, I would say. I mean, at least in Jakarta, you know, I, I, I have only been to Jakarta and, and Bali in, in, in Indonesia, so I can't really comment on the rest of the country. But Jakarta is definitely a very safe city. Um, uh, healthcare, uh, it's, it's reasonable. Um, international clinics are um, accessible, widely accessible in, in the city. So I don't think there's anything to worry about um, in terms of healthcare and safety. Yeah. Now, a lot of the founders are also having young families as well. And so can you just touch on education? Um, because that's a key consideration. Oh, yes. So education um, is always an issue when you try to bring family to, to a new country. Um, even in China, um, there are a lot of in international schools, but very expensive. Um, in Jakarta, uh, we do have uh, good international schools um, and they're relatively uh, more affordable than the Chinese ones, uh, but still uh, very costly, uh, but they're available. Yeah, yeah, okay, great. Uh, let's talk about um, B2B. Um, you know, you're obviously still in the B2C game uh, in e-commerce, in fact, online retailer. Uh, but from your vantage point, uh, you know, what are some of the key B2B trends uh, that you see in Indonesia? Uh, for example, do you think that e-commerce has migrated to the B2B sector? No, I think both, both segments of the market are growing very quickly. So we have B2B, we have B2C, B2B2C. Um, they're all um, filling up very different demand in, in the market and, and they're all growing. So, so Indonesia is, is still growing, the economy is still growing. Um, um, the consumer demand, uh, even during COVID, at, at least in our experience, is, is, still, is still quite robust. 
Um, of course, it's not as strong as we had anticipated before, um, but it is still growing. In terms of business to business ideas, uh, as long as you have the right services, um, for example, if you are looking to provide um, coding services uh, to startups, I mean, this is a very promising, I would say, a very promising uh, market to tackle. Yeah. And uh, I've got another question <laughs> uh, as well is um, actually back to the tech talent. Um, does language become a barrier? Uh, actually, you know, how, how, how is the communication like if you, if you have, you know, local developers? Yeah, it is always helpful if you're able to speak the local language. And most, um, most young people, um, they don't speak English that fluently. Of course, they, they have basic understanding of the English language. So, uh, and, and they will open up to you more if you can speak Bahasa, right? Um, so if, for example, for a foreign founder who has no knowledge of the Indonesian language to, to head a, a tech team, um, it's best to have, uh, best to recruit someone, um, a chief engineer or, or whatnot to help the, the communication process. Yeah. In fact, I understand Bahasa is one of the easier uh, languages to learn. Um, you know, you you obviously, you know, that classical Singaporean export, you speak uh, 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 Mandarin Chinese, you speak uh, Cantonese Chinese, that dialect. Uh, how was your personal experience learning Bahasa? Was it relatively easier to pick up than, um, than other languages in your experience? It, it is, um, to me, it is relatively easy uh, because I live in Kuala Lumpur uh, for a few years. Okay. In my um, uh, early years of my career. And I know a few Indian founders in, in Jakarta who are able to pick up Bahasa quite uh, easily. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So just a reminder, if there's any more questions, uh, please post them through. We'll get as many answered as, 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 as we can. Uh, do you see yourself staying there for, 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 uh, for a lot longer? <laughs> Are you gonna come back? Are we gonna get you back one day? Yeah, my, my, parents, um, my parents and my, my family, my wife and three kids are all in Singapore, right? So um, now that my traveling has been restricted because of COVID, um, it is hard. It is challenging for me to manage uh, my family situation. Um, and because of the young kids and because of the uh, lack of um, affordable schools in uh, international schools in Jakarta, um, it's really challenging for me to bring them over. Uh, so as a result, yeah, so um, that's going back to Singapore has always been a consideration. But so far, I'm enjoying my, my time in, in Jakarta and having a uh, great rapport working with my founders. Um, Fabio has a, a very promising uh, future. So no plan to move back yet. Yeah. 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 Okay, wonderful. Thank you. And, uh, you know, thank you for the very direct uh, and uh, friend and uh, uh, responses uh, to our questions. Uh, checking on the questions panel. In case you've missed any question, we would share it with you and Tuan later on as well, Chris. Okay, fantastic. Um, uh, Tuan, I had a question. Uh, Chris, uh, are there any cultural nuances that we need to take care of, uh, you know, from, uh, from a person or a startup growing from Singapore to, to Indonesia for the first time? certain sensitivities that they should take care of while dealing with the local population and growing their market there? Yeah, I mean, we, we always have to be sensitive. I mean, no matter where you are in, in Indonesia or China or Hong Kong, you have to be very sensitive to the local culture and the way they work in, um, 
how they react or respond to motivation or criticism. So these are basic um, uh, understanding we have to develop uh, in order to, to lead more effectively. So any tips that you would like to give our audience on what we should, uh, any basic tips that we should take care of and not make those blunders? Well, we, we, we should not um, expect the country and the people to change based on my expectations. Uh, I, I can't superimpose what I'm expecting from a Singapore workforce on Indonesian workforce. I just have to learn the local way and accept how, how it's being done here and try to optimize um, and get the best out of um, the people working with me. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, well, Chuan. Thank you, Chuan. Well, Chuan, you've been very succinct um, and, and, and I think we've um, really uh, gone through uh, a, a lot of items and, and give, uh, given the audience a, a real flavor uh, City, if there's no more questions, uh, perhaps we can um, just um, uh, provide uh, our audience members a way of staying in touch with Chuan and wrap up. Definitely. Thank you so much, Chuan. This was really useful for our audience. And we would be sharing the questions that could not be answered with Chuan and Chris later on after the session. Uh, Audience, thank you so much for spending the evening with us. Our next session is on June 17th, where we would be talking about expanding to the US market. So please stay tuned and please register for that session. Uh, we would be sharing the recording with all the attendees after the session gets over. So thank you so much. We would be launching a quick poll. I uh, would request all of you to please take a minute to fill that poll. This really helps us to improve from event after event. Yes. With that, Thank you so much, Chris, for moderating this session. You were awesome as usual. And we look forward to seeing you for our next. And thank you again, Chuan, for being with us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.